Okay, so if Game of Thrones really is prehistoric fiction, then who are the ancient hominids? you got the obvious candidates of the giants, who some of the maesters even say might be a more primeval form of man. And you've got the children of the forest, who harken back to this earlier time, more natural time, when hominids were more in tune with nature. And as I've already discussed, the children of the forest have a lot of the traits ascribed to the Neanderthals by researchers such as Stan Gooch. And they also have a lot of the qualities in ancient Welsh and Irish and Germanic myth, the brownies and the elves and the kobolds. But the most obvious parallel with Neanderthals that we have in A Song of Ice and Fire are the Ibanese and the Hairy Men. That's what we're going to focus on today. Hey everybody, welcome to Fantasy or Prehistory. We're talking today about Neanderthals in Game of Thrones and how it proves that A Song of Ice and Fire is really prehistoric fiction. We've got many more in this series, so please subscribe and check out the list. We come out with a new video every Thursday. The Ibanese are almost exactly like the Neanderthals. By studying the works of Martin, we can see that there must have been a race of people, predecessors to the Andals, the first men, the Valyrians, and it was a hairy race of people. And the evidence of this comes a lot from the world of Ice and Fire, but it comes from the books too. These people have ties to the Skagosi, who inhabit the island off the north coast of Westeros. The Ibanese are most definitely Neanderthals, and there's little traces of this ancient culture that must have once inhabited both Essos and Westeros in a date before written history or before the earliest memories of the civilizations that we know. As we talked about earlier, the maesters say that when the first men came to Westeros, the only other people who inhabited it were the giants and the first men. Now we've already talked about how that might, might not be true because of the sea stone chair and other evidences that there was this watery race or deep ones or Merlin's race that also lived at least on the coast of Westeros. But there was even a fourth race of people that were here before the first men, unless the first men were Neanderthals. Now they were ascribed to Bronze Age technology, so that probably isn't the case, or at least not totally the case. But what I find interesting is that though the Westerosi have knowledge of the Skagosi, who seem to be different than the other wildlings and Westerosi and First Men and North Men, and though they have knowledge of the Thins, who seem to have different customs altogether than the wildlings, they don't acknowledge another race. And it's also interesting that though the Ibanese have problems mating with humans, and though they're covered in hair and have sloped foreheads and are described very much as Neanderthals, they're not considered a different race. Like the children of the forest are, and like the giants are, and like the others or the white walkers are, or the Ifaquevron over in Essos, which is their version of the children of the forest. All those are definitely different races, but the Ibanese, even though they're so different than the other races of humankind and have real trouble reproducing with them, they're not considered a different race. Neither are the Skagosi, even though they seem far different than the wildlings and the Westerosi. So what's up with that? 
Well, let's first look at what we know about the Ibanese and their probable relatives in the world of ice and fire. On page 17, on the arrival of the Andals, they're talking about the beginnings of the Andals and how they conquered other tribes in Essos. And it says, the Andals brought iron weapons with them and suits of iron plates against which the tribes that inhabited these lands could do little. One such tribe was the Hairy Men. Their name is lost, but they are still remembered in certain Pentoshi histories. The Pentoshi believed them to be akin to the men of Ib, and the histories of that citadel largely agree. But some argue that the hairy men settled Ib, and others that the hairy men came first from Ib. We have another mention of the hairy men when speaking of the history of Lorath. Now Lorath was first inhabited by a mysterious race called the Maze Builders, who were bigger than men but not quite as big as giants. Remember that the Westerosi don't seem to differentiate between Neanderthal bones and human bones. They're all human bones to them. The only time they make a differentiation, differentiation between human bones and other races' bones is when they're talking about giants. So certainly the Ebenezer have left bones, but it doesn't seem that any of the scholars, or at least the maesters, are thinking of those as evidence of a different race, other than just Ebenezer. We have those right here. They look like Ebenezer. They have sloped foreheads, so they don't make a differentiation. So the maze runners could have had sloped foreheads like the Ebenezer, or the giants also have sloped foreheads, so who knows? But it says, Others followed the maze makers on Lorath in the centuries that followed. For a time the Isles were home to a small, dark, hairy people akin to the men of Ib. Fisherfolk, they lived along the coast and shunned the great mazes of their predecessors. They in turn were displaced by Andals, pushing north from Andalos to the shores of Lorath Bay. In the history of Norvos, we have yet another mention of the hairy race of people that seems to have dwelled in Essos before the takeover of the Andals. Though Great Norvos dominates the headwaters of the Rhoyne today, the Norvoshi are not descended from the Rhoynar who ruled that mighty river of old. Like the other free cities, Norvos is a daughter of Valyria. Yet before the Valyrians, another people dwelt along the Noyne, where Norvos stands today, raising rude villages of their own. Who were these predecessors? Some believe them to have been akin to the maze makers of Lorath, but that seems unlikely, for they built in wood, not stone, and left no mazes to confound us. Others suggest that they were cousins of the men of Ib. Most, however, believe them to have been Andals. Whoever these first Norvoshi might have been, their towns did not survive. Legend tells us they were driven from the Noin by the onslaught of hairy men out of the east, surely some close kin of the Ebenese. These invaders, in turn, were expelled by the fabled prince of Nizar, Garrus the Grey, but the Roynar did not linger, preferring the more temperate climes of the lower river to the dark skies and cold winds of the hills. Speaking of the grasslands in Essos, it says, The fisher queens were wise and benevolent and favored of the gods, we are told, and kings and lords and wise men sought the floating palace of their council. Beyond their domains, however, other peoples rose and fell and fought, struggling for a place in the sun. Some maesters believe that the first men originated here before beginning the long westward migration that took them across the arm of Dorn to Westeros. The Andals, too, may have arisen in the fertile fields south of the Silver Sea, 
Tales are told of the Hairy Men, a race of shaggy, savage warriors who rode to battle on unicorns. Though larger than the Ebenezer of the present, they may well have been their forebears. Through the centuries, many different peoples have made their homes upon the shores and islands of the Shivering Sea and sent their mariners across its chilly gray green waters. The most enduring and significant of these are the Ibanese, an ancient and taciturn race of islanders who have fished the northern seas since the dawn of days from their homes upon the Ibish Isles. The Ibanese stand apart from the other races of mankind. They are heavy people, broad about the chest and shoulders, but seldom standing more than five and a half feet in height, with thick, short legs and long arms. Though short and squat, they are ferociously strong at wrestling, their favorite sport. No man of the Seven Kingdoms can hope to equal them. Their faces, characterized by sloping brows with heavy ridges, small sunken eyes, great square teeth, and massive jaws, seem brutish and ugly to Westerosi eyes, an impression heightened by their guttural, grunting tongue. But in truth, the men of Ib are cunning folk, skilled craftsmen, able hunters and trackers, and doughty warriors. They are the most pursuit people in the known world. Though their flesh is pale with dark blue veins beneath their skin, their hair is dark and wiry. Ebenese men are heavily bearded. Wiry body hair covers their arms, legs, chest, and backs. Coarse dark hair is common amongst their women, even on the upper lip. The persistent myth that Ebenese females have six breasts has no truth to it, however. Though the men of Ib can father children upon the women of Westeros and other lands, the products of such unions are often malformed and inevitably sterile in the manner of mules. Ebenese females, when mated with men from other races, bring forth naught but stillbirths and monstrosities. Such matings are uncommon, though ships from the port of Ibn are a common sight in harbors up and down the narrow sea and even as far away as the Summer Isles and old Volantis. The sailors who crew them keep to their own kind even when ashore and display a deeply suspicious nature towards strangers. Now that's almost an exact description of Neanderthals. I mean the only thing you'd have to change is the word Ibanez, change it to Neanderthals, and you could change Seven Kingdoms to Hopo Sapiens and instead say Though short and squat, they are ferociously strong at wrestling. Their favorite sport, no man of homo sapien sapien descent can hope to equal them. It would be equally true if we were talking about Neanderthals. And if you said, their faces characterized by sloping brows with heavy ridges, small sucking eyes, great square teeth, and massive jaws seem brutish and ugly to homo sapien eyes, an impression heightened by their guttural grunting tongue, in truth, the men of Ib were cunning folk. That's also true if we were thinking of the Ibanese as Neanderthals. All the, way, all the way down to talking about the sterility. The description that Martin gives of the Ibanese sterility with Homo sapiens or Westerosi is much the same as the problem that Neanderthal probably had mating with humans. Modern humans have taken a lot of the genes of the Neanderthal genome and used them. So a lot of us have Neanderthal genes in us today. Nobody has all Neanderthal genes. All these genes are spread out over many different people and many different ethnic groups all over the world. And a lot of those different ethnic groups have different Neanderthal genes than say another ethnic group does or uh, another family or another blood bloodline does and what we found studying the Neanderthal genome is that the main parts that we didn't keep of the Neanderthal genes are found in the brain genes for sight and the testes so, in other words, there was something that was undesirable about having Neanderthal testes. If you were the 
product of a male Neanderthal and a female human, if you inherited your mother's side's genitalia genes, then you're okay. But if you inherited your father's, you might not be able to reproduce. Also, we're following the male preference in mammalian hybridization. We see in the Neanderthal gene, scientists suspect that it was only the Neanderthals mating with humans, not the other way around, as far as we can tell from genomic studies. And this is exactly what we're saying about the Ibanese in the Song of Ice and Fire. The offspring of Ibanese women and humans, or regular men, is always stillborn. But male Ibanese can breed with normal people, but it has a high rate of having birth defects and being sterile. Only sometimes does it create a viable hybrid that can then reproduce. Now here's the next thing. The Skagosi are there. They're on an island right there in Westeros. But when the Maesters are talking about the first inhabitants of Westeros, they mention, again, the children of the forest and the giants. They don't mention another race that the Skagosi could have come from. Now, there's um, a possibility that the Skagosi could be the descendants of Ebenezer seafarers, who were really great seafarers, who landed on that island. But another interesting thing is there are unicorns on the Skagosi Island, the island of Skagos, and they're rumored to be unicorns in the far north, maybe the land of always winter, and there are unicorns on Ib. These ancient hairy men who were bigger than the Ibanese, who fought the Andals and the first men in Essos before the first men or the Andals ever came to Westeros, are also rumored to have ridden to war on unicorns. I'm thinking that it's most probable that unicorn riding hairy men inhabited the whole of Essos and the whole of Westeros long before the Andals or the First Men or anything that is now considered normal non-hairy humans were in the area. The Stoneborn of Skagos Despite centuries of feuds, the mountain clans have traditionally remained loyal to the Starks through war and peace. The same cannot be said of the savage denizens of Skagos, the mountainous island east of the Bay of Seals. The Skagosi who reside there are little regarded by the other Northmen, who consider them no better than wildlings and name them Skags. The Skagosi call themselves the Stoneborn, referring to the fact that Skagos means stone in the old tongue. A huge, hairy, foul-smelling folk, some maesters believe the Skagosi to have a strong admixture of Ibanese blood. Others suggest that they may be descended from giants, clad in skins and furs and untanned hides. And said to ride on unicorns, the Skagosi are the subject of many a dark rumor, it is claimed that they still offer human sacrifice to their weirwoods, lure passing ships to destruction with false lights, and feed upon the flesh of men during winter. Like as not, the Skagosi surely did once practice cannibalism, though whether this custom still lingers to this day is a matter of much dispute. The Edge of the World, a collection of tales and legends complied compiled by Maester Balder, who served the commander of East Watch by the Sea during the 60-year rule of Lord Commander Osric Stark, is our chief source for much of what we know of the Skagosi, including the Feast of Skane, wherein a Skagosi war fleet descended upon the smaller nearby Isle of Skane 
raping and carrying off the Scanish women while slaying the Scanish men and consuming their flesh in a feast that lasted a fortnight. Whether this be true or not, Skane remains uninhabited to this day, though tumbled stones and overgrown foundations testify that men did once dwell amongst its windswept hills and stony shores. Though rarely seen off their island, the stone-born once were accustomed to crossing the Bay of Seals to trade or more off raid until King Brandon Stark, ninth of his name, broke their power once and for all, destroyed their ships, and forbade them the sea. For most of recorded history, they have remained on an isolated, backward, savage folk, as like to murder those who land upon their isle, as to trade with them. When they do consent to trade, the Skagosi offer pelts, obsidian blades, and arrowheads, and unicorn horns for goods they desire. Some Skagosi have served in the Night's Watch as well. More than a thousand years ago, a Kral, a member of a clan that passes for nobility on Skagos, was even Lord Commander for a time, and the Annals of the Black Centaur speak of a Stain, a member of another Skagosi family, who rose to become First Ranger but died shortly thereafter. Skagos has often been a source of trouble for the Starks, both as kings when they sought to conquer it and as lords when they fought to keep its fealty. Indeed, as recently as the reign of King Darren II Targaryen, Darren the Good, the Isle rose up against the Lord of Winterfell, a rebellion that lasted years and claimed the lives of thousands of others, including that of Barthagan Stark, Lord of Winterfell, called Barth Blacksword, before finally being put down. Interesting thing about these unicorns that are on Ib, they're on Skagos, they're in the land of all ways winter, purportedly, and they were also ridden by the tall hairy men of ancient Essos lore. A lot of times when we hear about unicorns and cannibals and hairy men, we also hear about mammoths, and this all seems to hearken to a earlier age, a prehistoric age, much like our prehistoric age, the deep glacial, glacial maximum of the Paleolithic era. Maybe in the long night, the whole world was the land of always winter, or at least all of Westeros and most of Essos, just like Dargoland and the British Isles were mostly cold and home to mammoths and unicorns in our own ice age. Unicorns were actually real. There's a creature called Elasmotherium that is related to rhinos and horses that have one horn, long legs, more like a horse or a goat than a rhinoceros, but it lived to a really late date in the Paleolithic era. They recently found it lived up to at least 25,000 years ago, and there are some reports by well-known scholars and chronicles and historians who have reported their existence in historical times. So this creature, this Elasmotherium or unicorn, is a lot like the unicorns described in the Song of Ice and Fire, and it always seems that the Neanderthals or Ibanese or Skagosi or hairy men are living in Paleolithic Ice Age environments, the last areas that are still like the ancient Ice Age that existed in Westeros and also the rest of the world in the Song of Ice and Fire. And it also existed in our own world here on planet Earth because planet Westeros and planet Earth are the same place. Neanderthals have often been equated with cannibalism over the years, and it's true that ancient man has as well, but Homo sapiens sapiens doesn't really like to think of themselves as cannibals. We always kind of blame it on the Neanderthal. People who have 
been studying the genes of Papua New Guineans over the past decade have noticed that there has been a sweep over them in recent years of the prion immunity gene, which protects against getting kuri, which is cannibal disease. It seems to have made a sweep over most people that modern humans descend from sometime during the last ice age. Neanderthals may have eaten their dead in winter, and winters lasted a long time. Early humans, especially in the northern uh, hemisphere, may have also shared this cultural trait with Neanderthals. And it was such an important part of their survival that those who did not have an immunity against Kuri, the disease you get from eating brains, disappeared from many populations in the northern hemisphere. Now, the one thing that you might see as differing between our Neanderthals and the Neanderthals of Planetos is the fact that George R. R. Martin has his Neanderthals sailing, sailing all over the place. They got some pretty awesome ships, ships that are said to be able to withstand the assaults of the Leviathans, and they're known throughout the lands as great whalers. Well, believe it or not, our Neanderthals here on planet Earth were whalers as well. We've recently found that the origins of sea travel go back at least 400,000 years at, and probably to a million years ago. The ancestors of the hobbits crossed the Wallace Line, which is deep, deep sea, over 780,000 years ago and left their fossils where we could find them. Homo erectus, or Homo heidelbergensis, left tools on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean 400 or 500,000 years ago. One of the last places that Neanderthals existed 20,000 years ago or so on the rock of Gibraltar in Iberia they were butchering dolphins. And some Neanderthal communities seem to have been ingesting a high amount of fish protein from studying their bones. So it's not too far off to imagine a late surviving race of Neanderthals becoming great seafarers. They would be a lot more resistant the cold, and especially the shivering sea, which is kind of like an arctic type of sea filled with ice and frigid water. Now, where did the Roinar and the Westerosi come from? Where did the first men come from? Where did the Andals come from? Where did the Valerians come from? I think there's a good chance that the first men are a mix of Homo sapiens sapiens and Neanderthals. As a matter of fact, they may have been, at least some clans, the Skagosi, the Mormonts, maybe the Starks, they may have been Neanderthals themselves. And there are several passages in the books that show some kind of link between the Starks and the Skagosi. Skagosis have a lot of links to the Ibanese. What if the first men, or at least some of the first men, were actually Neanderthals and they ruled Westeros until the first men with bronze came in? Those two races mixed. Then you'd have an answer as to why no other races mentioned in the books of the mas Maesters they don't mention another race because they were the other race. They were the Neanderthals, the hairy men, the first men were. Then came the later first men, who were more Cro-Magnon-like, the Lannisters, the Royce, 
and certain of the more southern houses who claim descent from the first men. I think that the maze builders were the hairy men and that the first men, when they first sprung up in Westeros, are probably a hybrid between your grassland nomad homo sapiens and the Neanderthals who lived before them. It seems that in Martin's world, the race of man or the genus homo is shrinking over time the oldest bones are the giants and then you got the maze builder bones you have memories of tall or man-sized hairy men and today you you only have short hairy men ones that are only five foot five like the Ebenese. maybe the Ebenese got trapped in the ice sheet before five foot five like the Ebenese. Why is it that the Lorathi hairy men are afraid of the mazes of their predecessors? Why are they even shorter than the Ebenese if they descended from such a tall group? Maybe it's because the invasion from the sea that is described as the reason while the maze builders abandoned the place was also a sexual conquest. You got short people from the sea attacking these giant hairy people that build the maze and those two things together create short hairy people. Or maybe the mix between the merlings, the aquatic apes, so to speak, that are hinted at through the sea stone chair and the black stones throughout the world of Westeros. Maybe these Merlins mixed with this ancient race of giants, proto-humans, Denisovans or Neanderthals or Homo erectus, and created a race that didn't have hair, i.e. Homo sapiens sapiens. Essos and but Westeros. Wherever we want to take this, wherever Just we want to go like with this, it still is pretty evident that the hairy men of the Essos prehistory, the hairy men of Lorath, the Skagosi, and the Ibanese are all related, and they and so pre again, preceded humans or regular men fire, or homo sapiens which sapiens. is more like our own prehistory than it is like fantasy Thanks everybody for checking out Fantasy or Prehistory is Game of Thrones Prehistoric Fiction. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll hit the like button. Can't wait to hear your comments. In the coming weeks, we'll be discussing Giants, Cro-Magnons, Heidelberg Genesis, and Denisovans in Game of Thrones. We'll also be talking about how the map of Planetos is really just a map of our own Ice Age world, and we'll also be talking about climate change in Planetos. The long nights of Planetos are really just the periods of glacial maximum during our own Ice Age, during the Pleistocene epoch of the planet Earth. So if Earth. you don't want to miss that, please subscribe. We come out with a new video every Thursday, and sometimes Wednesdays too.